everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Reading Party Podcast with Megan and Lexi. This episode continues our season looking at modern retellings of the Iliad and the Odyssey, ancient epics known for both brutal violence and instances of sexual assault. This episode is not suitable for under 18s. We hope you have your favourite beverage and snack ready to go, because we've got our teas and are ready to start spilling the tea on our latest ancient story. Well, hello, everyone. We are joined by the wonderful Maya Dean, who is the author of Wrath Goddess Sing. And as ever, we have Lexi, who is just generally awesome. Hello, ladies. How are you both? It's been a great day. And my day is now infinitely made even better because you two goddesses are here. Hooray! Well, we have, so we've got the first two episodes are looking at Wrath Goddess Maya and what we thought of it. And spoiler, we think it's amazing. You and I have already spoken about this uh, elsewhere, but because Lexi, you spoke to Maya actually before you read the book. So why don't, why don't you kick off with what you thought of it? Just my first thought was honestly just like shock and wonderment because I was like, I, I, I mean, honestly, I didn't even know what to think other than I like sped through it. Well, the second half. And then I was like, "What? D- this is fantastic. But wait, uh, but, uh, so I think just shock and awe. But also then when I had time to like sit down and sort of just start to think about what I had just read and to really internalize it, I was like, this is so cool. But also I think that the name of my entire experience reading this was also just like, wait, what oh my gosh that's so different so because i was sort of expecting certain things because obviously as you know every class just sort of knows the story and knows what's going to happen but since the first half kept me so like unbalanced because like things did happen but not in the way i expected it i was like the second half is obviously going to be the same and it's amazing i just i literally was like i don't know what to expect so i didn't it was interesting it was an interesting read as a classicist because i think i separated a little bit classicist brain from just pure reading fan of brain fantasy yeah because i think if i was reading it from enjoyment i would have just been like yeah yeah yeah, this is awesome okay what's next classicist brain definitely detached because it's like there was a part of me when reading it that it kept me just a little off balance where i was like no no, no i i, I want to know what's next I do know what's next, but I don't know what's next. So now I don't like this feeling because I feel very uncomfy because I feel like I know, but I don't know. Right, because you know um, you know what <laughs> is supposed to happen next, but how Maya is going to do it is uh-huh. like the real mystery. And yeah, sorry, I had to break yeah. in there. No, it was, it was fantastic. So I think I, I don't think that I've ever covered material that I know so so well but I I can I don't I think this is the first time and this is such a huge compliment for me I hope you know but this is the first time I've ever been able to read something like this and truly feel quite unbalanced when reading it because I just didn't know how the things I knew were gonna happen were gonna happen so I was like oh my god I like want to say I know this work but I don't know this work and so it was the funniest feeling to just be like yeah I know but I don't know yeah well there were a lot of places where i was like deliberately being like okay let's go with the b story here like because there are so many variants of all these stories but also let's throw in a nod to the a story well done (laughs) just well done thank you i'm so glad you liked it but megan obviously you finished it long before i did (laughs) i think A a little while ago yes Mm. And okay, so you've had time to sit with it. Loved every second. And actually, so I don't reread books. There are some old favorites that I'll go back to every like five, six, seven years. This I actually would like to reread probably by the end of the summer because I feel like there are lots of little bits and pieces that I caught the first time around, but I think I would probably appreciate more going back into it knowing the general arc of the story or at least how you present the arc of the story i think there are there are bits in there that will really 
pop out more than they maybe did the first time around. I did want to say that I really enjoyed how so it, it opens with Achilles on Ski Ross and I really like and this is kind of true for the whole book I like how you take source material and use it as a basis but then you are not afraid to like change it or elaborate it or add in details that make it really like really sing and that was absolutely not a deliberate reference to the title of the book that's just <laughs> <laughs> that's just me being accidentally weird i guess but i liked with the skiros story it's you take you take the source material and then you you go into it and you include these characters and they're so fully thought out and so well rounded and they're not i think i think when you're you're doing historical fiction especially historical fiction based on myth it's probably quite easy to take what is well known about them and then kind of stick there because you you want maybe to be like not to to read things back into the text but i think the way you do it is very clearly very appreciative of the original material but then the way that you adds to the characters makes them very believable and very relatable and and it's there's a lot of emotion in there i think is what i'm trying to say that i really as a reader i really really appreciate it did and so i guess did you find it difficult when you're working with characters that are so well known was it difficult to try and write them in a way that was particular to you rather than stick with maybe the stereotypes that we expect from everyone well, I think once you make the core change of the book, like once you look at Achilles on Skiros, not as a disguise, but as who she is, everything else has to change to accommodate that. And so much of it is an invitation to rethink things or to at least rethink things relative to the received tradition. You know, I don't think my Odysseus is particularly unusual as a take on the character. But because of the nature of the situation he's in, we're going to see a different side of him. And as I saw a different side of him, it made me think that perhaps there's been a lot of projection, for instance, because the whole idea, the whole like expectation, like Odysseus has this 21st century reputation as like a cheating womanizer, mm. par excellence. I don't think that's how he was read because I don't think the expectation of marital fidelity was the same or similar. And considering different cultural expectations made me think, well, you don't necessarily need to have the personality that's usually inferred in order to explain this pattern of facts. You can go with something maybe a little more joyful and a little weirder. I think that's that's a phrase that or a word that I used a lot in the first, when we were talking about the first half of the book, it is, even though it's a story of war and, and tragedy in a lot of respects, so many of the relationships are just full of joy. And it's, you you read it, and especially the relation the, the relationship between Odysseus and Mariapi and Patroclus is just, it's beautiful and it's so joyful and it's such a different understanding. I, again, in the first episode, I think Lexi and I said it's when you think about the querying of the Iliad, it's normally the Achilles Patroclus relationship that, mm -hmm. that gets that. And the way that you, you did it, it was, it was beautiful because they're such close like friends, close cousins that like they're family and adding Mary Appian, I think was, like really created a, a fantastic dynamic but the three of them they're like they're like the three musketeers traveling across <laughs> egypt and like defeating helen and it's it's beautifully done i i enjoyed it very much like i think people assume that queering has to be like a strictly sexual thing because there's a tendency to deny like the fullness of humanity mm -hmm. and i don't know some of the most intense romantic relationships aren't necessarily sexual mm -hmm. And some of the most intense sexual relationships aren't necessarily romantic. And I guess sort of uncoupling those things and not forcing them to be this. Yeah, there was a lot where I was just sort of exploring what could be. That would definitely be the name of the game. I mean, I was I was actually the most pleasantly surprised, I think, by the just like 
random trip to Egypt that I did not know was coming because I was like, oh, yeah, you know, I know the Trojan War. They just go and they, you know, fight for like, you know, nine and a half years, 10 years, whatever. And then, you know, I, 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 I it was so wonderful. I just get to this. And then they sail to Egypt. And I'm like, what? What? Okay. So, you know, what went into the decision of going into Egypt? I mean, obviously, Egypt is like a wonderful, amazing place. But, you know, yeah, what went into wanting to actually have them go for not too long, but they went. Well, several things. First, I mean, it's like a with Bronze Age technology, it's like a five day trip. Like, it's not far. And I feel like the smallness and the interconnectedness of the eastern mediterranean gets really underplayed in a lot of adaptations because if you're only really thinking about it as spaces on a map instead of oh yeah people live here and they go places and there aren't even at this point in time there are there aren't borders there aren't like you don't you know show up at customs there's a lot of just going places and you know if you cause trouble then you're in trouble so in terms of the story though one thing that I wanted to directly play with, there's a whole like legendarium where Helen spends the entire story in Egypt. Give me a second while I remember the name of Stesichorus. Stesichorus is the poet who seems to have pioneered that idea. And apparently he did so after writing some verses, trashing Helen and being struck blind. He was like, let's flatter Helen. Okay, she wasn't there. She wasn't even there. She was in Egypt. Everything was fine. And so I wanted to play with the idea of Helen in Egypt which I think is also like riffed on in the Odyssey, but only very vaguely. I wanted to play with that, but also just from a geopolitical sense, like the entire war actually happens on Egypt's periphery of influence. This is happening at the edge of the world, and it's a world where Egypt is at the center. It's a world where Egypt is like this very powerful regional superpower with diplomats and nobles with their finger and everything. Like the Mycenaean elite shows off their culture by like, painting images of the delta on their walls She's like look how cool i've got papyrus painted on my walls you can see i've been to egypt and with that in mind it just seemed like it would be a shame not to see what that center looks like not to sort of get a sense of the context of this world then too there is a lot of interconnectedness there basically it didn't seem like a stretch to me at all to think well clearly given how many times the gods in greek mythology have you know left something in Egypt or gone to Egypt real quickly or popped into Egypt to hide from monsters. It would be weird not to. I feel like it also, so the story is set like a few years after the Amana period and a few years. A century. A generation or so, <laughs> yeah. But a few years, a few years when we're talking like in terms of history. I feel like what you've done with that interconnected, this very much speaks to the history that we know of the region. And I, again, the first episode, we were talking about Mary Appy writing in cuneiform when you first meet her and how amazingly awesome that was. And it's like very, like it's rooted in the history. It, it would have been a thing. People were visiting everywhere and the, the kings and queens and, and royalty of, of these different powers were like in contact. So absolutely the interconnectedness I think is is integral to the history and, and to the story that you're telling. And I really enjoyed as well as the Egypt trip, I enjoyed your choice to have like the Hittites be the Trojans. That was you don't see Hittites a lot in historical mm-hmm. fiction. And I, they're one of the cultures that I I don't feel people have as great an awareness of as maybe they should because Hittites are awesome. So it, I really enjoyed having them there and, and having them as like major players in the historical period you're, you're setting the story in. I think one of the most interesting things is that although the Achaeans definitely lost their wars with the Hittites ultimately, like it looks like the Hittites won and that may be part of what triggered the Bronze Age collapse. But Even so, because of the persistence of Greek mythology and Greek literature, and because of their disinterest in talking about the Hittites, the Hittites just kind of vanished from history, which is wild. It's very confusing. But yeah, no, I mean, that that was just technically, Ulyssa was a Luwian city, but like, that just means part of the Hittite polity, but speaking a closely related Western Anatolian language. And... So there was never a question for me as to whether they would be Hittites. It just would not fit what we know of the archaeology of of the region. 
I was really interested in, there are a bunch of letters, like the Piyama Rodu letter, and there's like an Alexandu letter as well, which are basically either, some of them are to or from Wulusha to the Hittites, and then some are to the Achaeans about Wulusha. And they're really interesting because, as scholars have noticed, they're the thing we have that mo- from the period that most matches the Trojan War myths. Mm-hmm. So in thinking of the Trojan War legends as kind of a synthesis of a bunch of Achaean Hittite struggles, many of them centering on Wulusha, I was really interested in what that would actually be like as plot, how that would play out in a story. Mm -hmm. Because it adds a lot of context without really without really changing the overall thrust. It makes things make a lot more sense. For one thing, it explains why all these Anatolian cities are sending armies to defend Ulusha in a much more clear way than Priam just having really good <laughs> a really good diplomatic effort would. I I'm, I'm a bit curious. I want to skip around a bit, but I'm a bit curious cuz the so the the end when when I'm reading sort of around Achilles' death, it it was Shocking in more ways than one, but I'm I'm curious about the decision to not to have sort of the the gods, you know, clearly there killing her with these sort of invisible blows, but to not have anyone else really see what exactly is going on. I was I was like trying to process this as I was reading it. I was so it was like a split screen because my mind half my mind was like, okay, okay, so the gods are like getting her that's where you get the famous like shot in the heel but then i was like realizing as i was reading the other stuff that i was like but no one can see this wait but everyone else just sees her like thrashing around trying to birth neoptolemus so i'm just like wait what so i would have been like the most confused myrmidon if i'm just like seeing this right and i'm being like what the hell is going on this is not normal behavior during childbirth like what so so I'm like, what prompted this like split screen action here? I wanted to give the impression that she had sort of... So you know the part where Mariepi explains how magic works as sort of a heating up of reality? I wanted to give the impression mm-hmm. that she had sort of gone into the divine track fully, that she was on the divine wavelength or the divine heat range, and everyone else wasn't. Like, they can follow her, but not that far. So that we have a break into sort of the world of the divine or eternity, or I think it's one point the narrator calls it the world of spiritual forms. And I think also I was thinking about what the experience of death would be like, and people really can't follow you into that. So I wanted it to be wrenching. It was definitely wrenching. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, I was, like, confused, but also wrenched. So I was, like, a confused, just, like, puddle of, I don't even know, blood, sweat, and tears. Not, no, just kidding. But, yeah, no, I just, I read that, and I was like, what? But but I do love how, because I thought maybe it would just end with Achilles dying, and then I thought maybe that's, because, I mean, she's been really narrating most of it, so, so I, I was kind of like, okay, well, she'll die, and then maybe we'll get, like, a little, you know... <laughs> epilogue thing yeah thing or just says okay well and then and they were burned on a pyre you know whatever so i i was not expecting this like super like metaphysical chapter where it was like and they all lived actually but not in the way you think they do and i was like what have i completely just left my body on some astral plane and gone up to And then I was like, the fact that it was like something was like they were on the moon. And then I was like, what? I was like, wait, are they going into deep space now? (laughs) I was like, what is this? This is like ancient world science fiction slash something or other. I mean, it's super well done, but I was like, well, there is a bunch of there is a bunch of ancient world science fiction from late antiquity that like there's what is it? Lucian of Samosata has a piece which involves a trip to the moon and it gets really weird. So yeah, one of the things that I was interested in doing there was sort of stretching the idea of, like, I think there's an artificially narrow conception of the ancient imagination, which is dehumanizing to people who lived in the distant past and also just wrong. They were weird and incredibly sophisticated. And I wanted to, I wanted to give that. That part's been described as like, I don't know, like Voltron on the moon. (laughs) (laughs) 
kind of it was like transform it was like transformers honestly it was like yeah transformers it was transformers but then kind of sucking in all of the other deities as you go so you'll you end up as like a super transformer deity thing and i'm like this is wild oh my god wait i love that's what you were thinking no okay no i got the weirdest image for me I was like, it's like Super Smash Bros. Brawl where Kirby like eats. <gasps> Kirby! Where Kirby just like sucks in and eats. Kirby just swallows everyone. Exactly. So I was like, oh my God, it's like a Transformer Kirby like sucking everyone in. That's exactly what it was. Yes. It's yes. Pure, pure Kirby confirmed. <laughs> exactly. So Amazing. Kidding. And I like I liked that as like a, again, it, it I was completely expecting the book to end with Achilles' death. So, and it kept going and I was like, this is hmm, interesting. But it was really interesting the way that you kind of use that as a tool for all of the gods to kind of like find their peace with one another. Well, another thing is the spell Mariapi casts on Achilles before the pivotal moment where she can no longer cast spells, her, her big immortality spell is kind of heavily cribbed from the Pyramid of Unos and is basically a spell about killing the gods, about going to the sky and killing the gods. So part of that was just playing out the spell, like the whole sky mm. rains down, stars darken. I was just really interested in seeing what would that play, what would that look like? What is this? What happens mm. when you deploy the afterlife technology that you've been spending your whole life figuring out how to tweak? No, it was, it was really cool and i think it because throughout the book you're you're shown that this conflict has been ongoing for millennia and it reaches a resolution and then essentially everything gets reset like back to the start again and they have to play through it all over so knowing that at the end of of achilles story at the end someone would win and then you'd be sent right back to the beginning again so this kind of completely subverts that expectation because actually, no, it doesn't reset. Achilles and Mariapi and Patroclus completely change the way that history has been playing for thousands of years and force the gods to do the one thing that they've never really been able to do, which is to like come to a place of like kind of unity, I felt, like Helen aside. And kind of, it kind of frees the rest of humanity to do what it is that they need to do. Like without having the gods hanging over them and, and influencing things the way that they have been. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It was, it was cool. I also really like the language you used where you talk about like it being cycles because that was really, well, I read it as like a super influenced version of Norse mythology because all Norse mythology is, is like literally talking about how life and everything is in a cycle and so you know like surviving one cycle and going to the next i'm like oh that's a super norse thing and so having already you know read and seen that you use a lot of different cultures and influences i kind of like that nod i don't know i just i just kept feeling like man that's something odin would have said like next it's also cycle. something that shows up in egyptian mythology like just that cyclicality and it's something where I, I was definitely thinking of Hesiod's Theogony there because, like, there's that really you see that same cycle play out repeatedly there mm. with the different ages and also with the different generations of gods. That was something I was really interested in thinking about and also really interested in thinking about that in historical time and that and thinking about those sequences of gods as reflections of human memories of gods rising and falling. And of different, I guess, phases of the trauma of human civilization. Mm. Trauma is an excellent way to describe that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, are you familiar with the Kumarbi myth? Yeah. yeah. So Kumarbi myth, the resemblance to the Kronos myth really, really, really struck me. Especially given the way that Tarhuna is a huge influence on Zeus, on Zeus iconography and so on. So I was really interested in exploring the ways that we see these cycles play out across a range of mythology. And maybe that's a total coincidence, or maybe that reflects the fact that human history is interconnected and has gone through cycles. I mean, whether or not we're on the verge of a of yet another collapse 
our own well, collapse, yeah. Whether or not we are, certainly, like, we've been through so many. The Roman Empire and, like, the Han Dynasty collapsing at roughly the same time, so much, like, across the world has been pulsed, has been cyclical. And, yeah, I wanted to get at the the memory, the memory of cycles, the memory of collapse cycles. And actually... A lot of the book is dealing with ideas of cultural memory. I think I probably mentioned this at some point. Because while I'm deeply fascinated by history and deeply fascinated by snapshots of myth, the changing face of memory, the di- like the, the dynamic changing face of memory is something I, I find incredibly interesting as a story. Kind of the meta story changes with time. And then we think we know what the story is. And then we don't. No, it was it was very, very well written. And actually to kind of shift the conversation a little bit, I was very impressed with what you did with the blood sacrifice idea. And blood sacrifice is something that we see like throughout history. You want to make a sacrifice to the gods, you have to kill an animal, generally speaking, or give food, but often it, it's, it's the, the killing of an animal. And... The way that you made the entire war into a mechanism by which the gods can get as many blood sacrifices in as short a period of time as they possibly could to kind of supercharge their powers was really, I thought it was very, very clever. And again, completely, like like I said, the theme for this book is unexpected, completely unexpected. And it's... I just have this this vision when I was reading through the battle scenes, especially of like, and, and you describe it so well, of the battle raging and these kind of like giant ghostly deities kind of hovering above their chosen heroes, like absorbing all of this like, energy, life force as people are killed and are dying. And it was a very like powerful kind of compelling image. And it, it, it gives it gives a purpose to the war where I feel sometimes in in some adaptations the the idea of it being just to get back a a queen isn't always as believable Mm -hmm. but having it be like the gods need the death to happen i thought was really really cool there's so one of the things that i really was fascinated by when i was researching different thoughts about the war in the classical period. And one of the oldest sort of explanations for why there was a war was essentially to kill all the demigods because there were too many powerful demigods. Interesting. Yeah, I forget whose whose theory that was, but I think that's like a pre-classical idea. And it ties into the myth of Zeus uh, not not deciding to have a child with Thetan in, in some myths, specifically because there's this doom pronounced on her that she's going to have a child more powerful than the father at which point in those variants of the myth Zeus is like you must marry a mortal otherwise I could be in for a chronosing and I thought that was interesting but I was also really fascinated by the ways that we have all these myths that are essentially trying to retcon the possibility of the gods wanting human sacrifices like what is Tantalus's crime against the gods he tries to give them human sacrifices and tricks Demeter into eating his son, which is a completely weird myth, especially weird if you assume that there was never any context of human sacrifice, which to their credit, the classical Greeks did not assume. They assumed that at some point that had been a thing, which is why there's human sacrifice layered in through so many myths, like like the Iphigenia at Aulis I did not go with. And... With that in mind, like, why would you have a human sacrifice layer sort of buried in there? Why do so many cultures show signs of finding ways around human sacrifice? And why do human sacrifices even, like, show up startlingly late in Extremis? Like, I I recall reading the bit in Polybius where he's talking about how at the height of the Punic War, the Roman Senate looked at really, really, really old, scary books of instructions and realized that they'd had to sacrifice four foreigners by burying them under the city. And then they did. And with human sacrifice kind of floating in the background and with with the many ways in which human societies are really built around human sacrifice. Mm. I mean, the reason that Ursula Le Guin's, the ones that walk away from Amalus, uh, resonates is because I think on some level everyone is aware that 
there's this intense exploitation taking place that allows the civilizations we've created to exist. So why wouldn't the gods be involved there? Mm -hmm. I want to jump in and say I was fascinated also on a different separate note, but nonetheless fascinated because I was expecting at some point, obviously, we all love Patroclus. I think that's pretty evident. But knowing the original source material, I was like, okay, he's probably going to die. I mean, I was like, there's a lot of things that are changed. But I was like, he's probably going to so, like die. So, But again, things happen unexpectedly that I was not prepared for. So I thought... Can I just say right here, Zeus is an asshole. Yes, that too. <laughs> just completely unrelated. No, Carry on. that's true. But no, I, was, I guess I was just going toward the really interesting way in which you had because i was also like well in this version if achilles and agamemnon are like lovers i was like well how are they gonna get so pissed that achilles pouts so i thought it was just a really interesting creative decision to have achilles pout and sit out not because briseis was taken mm -hmm. you had briseis volunt or briseis was voluntarily leave because Achilles is mourning Mariapi, and I just found that such an interesting choice. Can you just like tell us where, like, how that decision got made? Mm -hmm. So one of the one of the constraints that I placed on this book was whatever happens in it, it has to be intelligible how it could be turned into the Iliad by five hundred years later. Mm -hmm. How in the retelling, in the way that story becomes legend and legend becomes myth it could end up the Iliad by the time it reaches the epic period. So while Achilles' reasons are very, like for what she does after Mayopi dies, are very clear to her, they're already opaque and mysterious to most of the other Achaeans. And something like Brissawol joining Agamemnon could easily be interpreted as a power struggle between the two of them based on what plays out. I wanted to build the groundwork so that it's easy to understand how a different story could easily overwrite this story and kind of construct or recover a sub-layer under the Iliad narrative. So I think it's more interesting. It's more interesting to explore, like to let this sit under that and have this layer of story underneath to be to be excavated. It's definitely, I, I felt Mariappi, Mariappi's death and Achilles' subsequent refusal to fight i felt the reasoning was a lot more a lot more compelling and a lot more human maybe than than what we're given in in the iliad and i think in a lot of other adaptations because they do generally speaking stick to it's it's a dispute between two men over over a woman this felt much more much more real and kind of visceral and like I, I really empathized with Achilles, I think, in a way that generally we don't mm -hmm. with with the figure of Achilles in the myth and again in, in the retelling. And even though your Achilles is appropriately bloodthirsty and is like a warrior born, she is more human and more relatable and understandable as you write her, I think, than than a lot of other Achilles that I've come across. That was what I was going for. One of the things that, that happened when I envisioned Achilles, not as the pouting warrior, but as an equally chaotic Bronze Age trans woman, was that I instantly understood so many things about her much more clearly. And the entire plot of the Iliad became like a subplot in a larger life that has been mm -hmm. misunderstood, which I found... Yeah compelling to explore. In the Iliad, the gods are strangely positioned. They're inscrutable because we're not seeing them from the perspective of a demigod. We're seeing them from the perspective of confused humans watching this play out. Mm -hmm. If I were to locate the narrative of the Iliad, in a lot of ways I would have to say like the position of the narrator is as though a less cranky friend of Thersites had access to what was going on in the divine councils, but not to what it meant. And so I was really interested more to 
portray this from the perspective of someone who's kind of caught between the human and the divine worlds. And at this point in the story is being pulled away into the divine world to an increasing extent, which is always Achilles' arc. I think it was it was done very well and you you really do capture that confusion and the like the positioning of Achilles in that liminal space because obviously the story is told from Achilles' point of view. We as the audience know what's going on in the divine world. We know the reasoning behind it because it has been explained to Achilles and it makes sense to Achilles. But Achilles cannot explain it to her mortal family and her friends and everyone else fighting this war. There is no way she can explain it that will make sense or even be vaguely believable. So you get this, you get the confusion of humanity and you get the, like, the knowledge and the agency maybe of the divine realm and then straight in the middle is Achilles who is doing her best to really like navigate through this in a way that keeps as many people that she loves as safe as possible while also resolving the conflict that she's irrevocably drawn into it was it was the balance was fantastic and you definitely get that feeling almost of helplessness from from Achilles to like explain what's happening yeah that was something that I had in mind when I was writing the, like, there are there are a lot of plot beats in the Iliad that are there but mean something totally different. When I was writing the final battle with Hector, which is always played as this grand final battle between two roughly evenly matched warriors, even though it's, it's generally remembered that way. In the Iliad, it's an execution. In Shakespeare's version of that scene, it is literally an execution. Do you know the scene in Troilus and Cressida? Mm-mm. Oh my god, it's hilarious and really depressing. In Troilus and Cressida, you've got this like flamboyant Achilles who's spent the entire story just sort of swanning around looking gorgeous. And finally sees Hector literally like broken down on the side of the road. His chariot is busted. Achilles has this entire gang of, of servants. And there's Hector, just like can't get out of the wreck of his chariot or whatever. And Achilles is just like, servants, beat him to death. And then we'll explain that I heroically killed him. And in a lot of versions of the story, it is positioned basically as an execution or a a murder between vastly uneven foes. But I think it's generally remembered as this epic battle. And I was at pains to show that they're actually on totally different reality levels. Like Mm -hmm. Hector is a human who's trying to defend his family and his city and is behaving in a recognizably human way. And he makes sense. And I can sort of count on the reader to bring in sympathy from Hector from all the existing versions of the story, starting with the Iliad. And for Achilles, she knows he's a person. She's seen him. She's intimately experienced the beauty of his perspective. But also, he's a means to an end in her struggle with Helen here, and that takes place on the divine stage. And so she is ruthlessly butchering him basically to hit out at Helen. And I wanted to capture that, that sort of, this is not the same story for everyone. Perspective changes with what the story is. I, I think you did that very well. And I, I also think through through the book, there's a very deliberate arc of Achilles as mortal to Achilles as goddess. And it each new interaction, I feel like with the divine, pulls Achilles a little bit further and further into the divine realm. And she never really, each time she's pulled in, she never comes back out. It felt as a reader, she never comes back out as far as she was. So even though it's it's by little, little increments, by the end, I mean, not she obviously is a goddess, right, at the, at the very end of the book, but it feels like her humanity very slowly and her like her understanding like Patroclus and Meriapi aside I think they're special cases but her understanding of everybody else's humanity kind of drains out of her because she gets more and more into the divine realm and really what matters now is ending the battle and defeating Helen and that was very very cleverly done it's just little by little by little and you don't you don't fully realize what's happening until you get to the end and you're like Okay, this 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 character is not even. We don't even have one foot in the mortal world anymore. We're completely, well, we're on the moon. So you know, but it really is interesting because I was also noticing when I was reading it that it's kind of like how the duel between Hector and Achilles was quite a bit shorter and did not get nearly as much fanfare as I thought it was. When you read the Iliad, you know it's 
interesting in its storytelling because it's like I always think of it like if you were filming it as a movie it's you get sort of you go out you get big picture but then you, you zoom in on individual people individual duels and all this stuff and so I was kind of expecting maybe your book to do the same where you would go in on these very special like duels but then we have the the f- famous sort of duel to end the war right which is like you have okay you know Paris basically or you know Alexander like challenging Menelaus and uh, to not even get that I thought that was an interesting choice to have it from afar because you know in most movies and other adaptations it, it is a big part and so to have the duel between them that's supposed to end the whole war be like yeah it's there it's little it's short it was honestly all the duels were short I was like what all the duels are short you know yeah it just it it, it was really interesting because I was expecting some of these famous ones and then either they happened but they were like really short or they didn't because I mean, I, I mean, I think another of those duels was, you know, uh, Achilles and Penthesilea. It's another quite famous duel. And I was like, oh, okay, it's going to be hyped up. It's going to be great. And then it was like, Achilles, furious, rages on the battlefield, sees her. The gods are like mulling around doing things. She stabs her spear and then Penthesilea is dead. And you're like, oh, goodbye, Penthesilea. That was very short. Thank you for gracing us with your presence next. Yeah, I mean, Penthesilea isn't even in the Iliad. I kind of fudged things to get her into the narrative. But I, at that point, I wanted almost to focus on the horror of it. Because, yeah, if you're in Achaea and watching, watching Achilles storm through the battlefield, systematically butchering your enemies, it's really cool. But if you're Achilles in a state of cataclysmic murder grief, it's just another person you're killing in a way where hopefully she'll die slowly enough so that you can obtain her sacrifice for yourself instead of letting Helen have her. And that dehumanization of these like glor- of the glorification of war was was something I was was really interested in exploring there because she already has had those like big epic battles earlier on. But at some point it's more like a knot in Canaanite mythology where she's just going around slaughtering people and feasting on their blood. After we have the the epic pitched battles, it's it's butchering, and it's it's very it's very deliberately done. And I feel like at the beginning, Achilles like takes some pride mm-hmm. in in what she's doing, and this is like this is a skill. This is what I am good at. It's it's what I do. And then towards the end, like the grief murder age, it's just like I'm stronger than everyone else. I can literally kill anyone on this battlefield, and I'm going to do it. Because that's that's what needs to be done. All, all of the the glory, such as there was, is completely just. Mm-hmm. It, it's it doesn't even figure anymore. Yeah, because what we're really building up to is grief. We're building up to funerals. I mean, this is a story that really finds one of its emotional climaxes in funerals. And I think others have done the glorification of war better than I can. So I wanted to focus on the horror. I, I think, and I think especially because of, of what happens to Mary Appy and her child, I think focusing on the horror works for the story. I think it works very, very well. And it gives us something different because s- since everyone does sort of glorify the war, you know, it'd be easy to fall into just yet another, oh, look, a book about the Trojan War, more glorious warfare and this, that, and the other thing. Woo! You know, sort of focus completely differently on something else. Yeah, I thought that was, like, really good choice. It worked for the book. It works for the characters that you've created. I don't think... Yeah, it just it would have been a very different book if you had gone the other direction. There are these huge anti-war threads in the Iliad that I think kind of went maybe underappreciated by its most royal boosters through history, which are deeply critical of warfare. And it's also kind of where we have Ili- um, Achilles start the narrative before she kind of gets drunk on power. Where she's like, well, I don't know. It's killing a lot of people you don't know. And then she's like, but this could be fun. It could be fun to kill a lot of people you don't know. And then by the end of the story, it's clearly tragic. That was definitely something that I wanted to explore. Yeah, the Iliad is a very sad story. It is. It really is. And I, I, a lot of adaptations obviously capture the sadness, but I think 
one of the things that yours did particularly well was this focus and it, it pops up in several places this focus on the the mother child relationship and how things like war and conflict kind of impact that and the immense grief that you get when you lose either like a parent or a child and you like obviously you see it with with Mary Appy and and her her baby she dies in childbirth and, and the child doesn't survive you see it obviously Achilles like, dies during childbirth also but then you've also got you've got Venus and her son and the number of times that she kind of puts herself in front of his body to keep him safe and the, the, like yes she's divine she's probably going to survive but like the length she's willing to go as a parent to protect her son on the battlefield and also the relationship between Achilles and Athena is is a parental one and you kind of as the war progresses you see even though they're not close I, I wouldn't say they're close at the end either but they're definitely not close to begin with they they kind of edge closer and you see even though they don't have this like typical mother-daughter relationship Athena is still doing what she can to shield Achilles from the worst of Helen's attacks. Obviously, there's probably a conversation to be had about she's her parent and, and like she put Achilles kind of in the middle of this mess. So maybe that's not the best parenting in the whole entire world. But like even within the within the realms of the divine, like the divine person that you've created who is very clearly not human, there's still this kind of maternal parental protective instinct that she's trying to mitigate the damage that's being done during this war and it, i i don't know if it was like a deliberate choice on your part to have so many little instances of motherhood playing out through through the story but it was it was interesting to me as a parent it's not something that you often see in these kinds of mythological retellings and it was and it provided a very interesting counterpoint to like achilles as glorious warrior I, I appreciated that. That was actually one of the things that most struck me about the Iliad every time I read it. I mean, as a child, I was so fascinated by the scene where Diomedes, Diomedes, decides to take out Aphrodite because she's really on the battlefield for the reason that I portrayed her as being on the battlefield in Wrath Goddess Sing, to protect her son. And she keeps showing up specifically to do that. And that's something that really struck me. We'll pretend that was a clever pun. That's something that really struck me because usually we don't see gods bleed. Mm -hmm. But we do see Aphrodite bleed to protect Aeneas. And that's like the only time you actually see like gods cry out in pain. It's an amazing moment. So that fascinated me. Athena's big emblem in a lot of ways is a shield. I mean, depends how you decide to interpret it, but typically is presented as a shield. And I was very interested in what it would mean. And also I'm just fascinated by bad, with air quotes, mothers, by like, there's a very circumscribed and simplified and spe culturally specific form of motherhood that is treated as doing it right. That's probably a historical anomaly that wouldn't make sense throughout most of human history and prehistory. And really protecting your children is like, is there a way to do it right? It's so situational. It seems like the kind of thing you figure out on the fly and probably fuck up as often as not. And so to take a character who is literally so far down her own path of godhood that she can't read human facial expressions anymore and mostly figures out what people's moods are by like mapping their neurological patterns and yet she's trying to not empathize with, but certainly keep in one piece this incredibly moody, very human daughter whom she just cannot possibly understand anymore and who cannot understand her because they're separated by, you know, 10,000 years or so of existence. That really fascinated and struck me. Just what would that actually play out as? We have this scene in the Iliad where Athena protects Achilles in, like, the first scene, like, grabs Achilles by the hair and is like, don't kill Agamemnon. 
But I was really interested in what does it look like when you cannot possibly protect your child, but you still try, when maybe she's existentially unprotectable. Because, like, in the Iliad, Pedo says, like, yeah, I'll do whatever you want. This is going to get you killed. Cool, right? And I wanted to explore the very different relationship with Athena, who's like, no, this is going to get you killed. Don't do it. <laughs> And what happens when all you can do is, like, put yourself in the path of incoming missiles that will take you, like, you will die. And it won't actually prevent your child's death, but, you know. Yeah. I, it's, no, it was very interesting to read. But also, I just, you know, your portrayal of Athena is so different from anyone else's. Because, you know, I, I, I think we all have this kind of, like, we we have this perception of Athena. We have this perception of how she will be portrayed. And honestly, you know, it's not even that, that she's per, like portrayed usually as this super sweet, you know, sympathetic figure who you're just like, like, you know, so you, you I don't even know what you're expecting from her, but I guess I had a version of her built up in my mind. But then to see this version, it was, it was quite jarring, but also quite a happy interesting twist but also honestly the overarching thought i had was this woman needs a goddamn mood board like can someone just give her a mood board because it would make her like everything so much more chill like she has no chill in this one and i'm like yeah but i'm used to like seeing my benevolent athena you know my palace athena just you know she's so she's so like in, in all her statues she's like serene and calm the calm defender of her city and 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 her warriors and you know she's all about battle strategy and cunning so i think you know just from even her epithets you're kind of like okay so she'll be just like cold calm calculating she has a lot of chill she just doesn't like explode and then to have this one just be like Argh! i was like Ooh! Okay, this is not my cold, calculating, gray-eyed Athena who just will, like, stare serenely as the benevolent goddess. This is like, nah, honey, y'all need to chill. Like, y'all need to chill. <laughs> yeah, I was really interested in, like, I mean, with divine powers, who could resist the impulse to try to understand the universe? to watch things, to see how things play out, to be a bit of a mad scientist, to turn into an owl, to swivel your head 370 degrees on your neck because you can, to be unable to rotate your eyes in their sockets because they're too big, to try to like ferret out the secrets of biology and geology using divine senses and divine powers. That will seem enormously wise to the mortals who interact with you even if you're essentially like a mad scientist who has no social skills. <laughs> and occasionally turns into an owl. And occasionally turns into an owl and frequently remembers that dead people are in fact made of meat. <laughs> yeah, that was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and also kind of sweet, like her thought process seemed to be, well, if they die, then, then they're gone forever and all of their experiences are lost. But if I eat them, then they kind of live on in me because I remember what they remember and, and they they stay. I, like, I could absolutely see where she was coming from, but also, no, no, let's let's not do that. Yeah, I know. She, right she strikes me as such a lonely me. goddess. And so much of, like, her interaction with history is literally drinking the memories out of the dead. It kind of went pretty intensely with the owl stuff. That stuff was awesome. And also yeah. there are like there are vulture deities in like Neolithic Turkey, which have a similar I don't know, they strike me with a similar vibe. There's a whole a whole extended Neolithic period where you have lots of settlements with like severed heads of ancestors being kept under floors. And I thought, well, why would you do that? Well, maybe because that's where their thoughts are. That's where their memories are. What kind of goddess would have had her formative experiences in such environments. Maybe one who agrees that that's where people's thoughts and memories are. And this is the closest she can come to not being alone. 
It was definitely interesting to read also just because whether I mean to or not, I was so taken with the characterization of not just Athena, the other goddesses too, but but mostly with Athena, I suppose, since she's my favorite. The one from Natalie Haynes' A Thousand Ships, just because... Her goddesses were so childish. And the one thing that sticks out to me is always the the line, like the, no, you cannot have my owl. It's mine. So, you know, like having that sort of in the back of my head and then seeing what you're doing with her owl here, I was like, oh my gosh, this isn't just some like little tawny owl that she's like possessively like, it's mine. It's my pet to like full-on like demon bird i mean all the descriptions of the talons and the i was like oh geez man this is yeah i mean if, if your goddess showed up and she was owl like enough that an owl became her symbol forever that would actually be really scary yeah it, yeah it would and that like all of the gods you present all the gods and goddesses are scary as mm-hmm. i think oh, they God, should goddess be is my favorite <laughs> yes Yes, and she is also terrifying, mm-hmm, especially mm-hmm, when you mm-hmm. think about her priestess and what happens to her priestess. And Zeus is like, oh, yeah, cow goddess just uses her hosts up and there's not really much left of them. I'm like, really? Wow, that's fun. You just hollow out the poor girl's brain and, and live there for a while and then go away. And now she's just essentially in a waking coma. Is that what I'm understanding here? That's wow. OK. Yeah, Cow Goddess is not nice. <laughs> Understatement of the year. <laughs> but she gives she has great lines. She does. She does have great lines. I'd like to see her written into like a like a movie or something. Just to see that sass come to life, you know? You just gotta cast like the sassiest actress ever. Cosmic sass. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm so here for it. No, I mean, I think like the overarching theme of the entire book is one unexpected, two sassy, two three scary, and four space transformers who are like Kirby. I think you've summed it up. Like no one needs to read it now. Just those four things. Job done. And oh, dolphins. well, I definitely hope people read it. Oh, true. yeah, yeah. And dolphins, and and dolphins and are dolphins. scary. Dolphins are not good people. No. I mean, they're people, so. Some good, some They're bad. People. Yeah. Yeah. Some good, some bad. If you go randomly meet a bunch of them, you're probably going to run into some jerks. Yeah, because they always want humans to just approach them creepily and take their clothes off and then try to figure out how to not drown them while you're trying to, like, have sex with them. <laughs> like, it's okay. These dolphins, these are the scariest dolphins I've ever <laughs> heard of. So I was like, you know. I kind of was like, I want to go watch one of those like nice, safe, you know, child-approved. Gonna like, turn Disney on. Yeah, like like I want a <laughs> safe, child-approved like Discovery Channel documentary on how pretty dolphins are so nice and adorable. And then you turn on documentaries about dolphins, and it's like dolphins commit murder. Yeah, yeah, like, dolphins and sea otters don't actually ever look up what sea otters are like in real life. I feel like dolphins are probably similarly awful in places. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, dolphins are definitely like they're scary. They're they're intense. So with that delightful note on on sea otters and dolphins, we're about the 1 hour mark. Did either of you have anything you wanted to cover or discuss before we wrap this up? Ooh, I mean, you know, huge question. Yeah, I'm like, because it's like I have too many questions, but we don't have all the time in the world, which make this makes this infinitely difficult. But so so instead of launching into to another question, which will, you know, like spark another hundred thousand questions, I'm just going to say, well done. I mean, I finished reading this just last night in preparation and man, I I blasted through the rest of it so quickly. I mean, I was like, where was the time? It was, it was, you know, it was quite a rush to read. I definitely want to reread it to, to sort of go back and then be like, okay, so I read it. I know what happens, but now I need to internalize more of this. There are lots of little uh, bits of nuance that I think will really sink in the second time. Like if you read Achilles' Aristea with the Iliad open, you'll see that like a major, like I do have her kill all those people. She just doesn't know their names or care. Yeah, 
Yeah. So I'm just going to say, well done, Maya, though. It's 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 fantastic. When I interviewed you for Ancient Office Hours, before I'd read the book, I already had a feeling that it was going to be just fantastic. I think I called it like dream breaking or something to that effect. I don't even remember what I called it because I probably had too many words for it. But yeah, no, it was just a, a, as, as incredibly amazing, but also unexpected as I thought it would be. So just just good job. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm so glad you liked no it's it's a beautifully written book it's incredibly compelling and it really does treat a very familiar story in a way that is new and surprising at almost every turn so for the people listening even if you are familiar with the iliad doesn't matter how many times you've seen any of the troy adaptations i like i think lexi and i both wholeheartedly recommend this book it's a beautiful read and it is like we said all along completely unexpected in all ways yeah yeah and that's not something you can say about material that has been so well done and overdone. And no, it's quite whatever. an accomplishment. <laughs> so Maya, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for writing a wonderful book. And mm -hmm. could you, like, I know you're working on something new right now. Could you give us like a brief 30 seconds teaser for your next project? Sure. The project I'm working on now is an exploration of the Joseph and Egypt myths, which are like have are at the foundation of like they're involved in so many mythologies at this point. But if you focus on the Bronze Age antecedents that they would be a retelling of, if you set it, if you locate it at a moment in history, I've chosen to go right before the Amarna period and sort of explore what the Joseph in Egypt myth looks like right at the end of the right at the end of the period of Amenhotep III, at sort of the height of ancient Egyptian imperialism, and it's fascinating. And I'm very much taking a, you know, don't think of like the Egyptological illusion here, but sort of focus on the particularities of this particular setting at this particular moment in time and what we know about that. I mean, for one thing, none of the names are pronounced the way that we that we think of them as being pronounced. I spent a lot of time just trying to figure out exactly like transliteration is a is a, is a challenge. Uh, I'm looking forward to that for sure. And oh, finally, before I forget, where can people find you and follow you in your work? So my website is mayadean.com. On pretty much all social media, I'm mayadean writer. And my book can be found pretty much anywhere books are sold. If it's not in your bookstore, feel free to order it there. Otherwise, Amazon, bookshop.org, Barnes & Noble, HarperCollins has a page. And we will put links to all of that in the show notes. So go, mm -hmm. if you have not read it, please do read it. And then listen to this interview again, because I feel like a lot of things will make a lot more sense. Well, thank you, Maya, again. Lexi, it's always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Of course, of course. And we will see everyone else next week when we will be discussing the 2004 movie Troy starring Brad Pitt. Hey, thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a review. And you can also follow us on social media at The Reading Party Podcast. If you'd like to leave us a book or movie suggestion, then email us at thereadingpartypod at gmail.com. See you next week. Mm -hmm.